Thanks, Helen. Um, and as always, you know, big thanks to Ellen for doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the background, getting these things um, set up. So um, for those who don't know me, my name is Russell Wynn. Um, I'm based down in the New Forest in Hampshire. I was until recently manager of the Curlew Recovery Partnership for England. I'm a trustee of Curlew Action um, and, uh, and a field worker on Curlews and, and many other things besides. And when I was manager of the Curlew Recovery Partnership, together with Mary Colwell, the um, chair, we, we used to give a lot of presentations, both in the UK and internationally when we went on, on tour. And I'm just going to show a couple of slides from those presentations just to set the scene for, for this evening. And the first thing is really to remember that you know, we hold a significant chunk of the world breeding population of Eurasian Curlew in the UK. And together with um, hotspots such as um, areas of Finland, particularly the sort of centre um, south of Finland, and the low countries, particularly the Netherlands, parts of Germany, you know, we hold a big chunk of that global breeding um, population of the species. And the data here is from the European uh, Breeding Bird Atlas, fantastic publication. And this is really just the model breeding distribution, like a density map. So the darker the green, the more um, curlews there are in, in its simplest sense. Next slide, please, Ellen. So with that context that we've got about a quarter of the global breeding population in the UK, uh, the absolute figures, the last estimates are around 60,000 breeding pairs, but they are uh, many years um, out of date now. Um, and it's very likely that the current level of breeding pairs in the UK is, is quite a bit lower than that. Um, but there's a lot of um, uncertainty around that. We, we just don't know. We know that they're in, in long term decline. Um, but it's one of the big questions at the minute is what really is the absolute breeding uh, population in the UK and in different regions of the UK. About half of those pairs are estimated to be in England, but again, that 25,000 may be very much towards the upper limit um, of the uh, of the error bars today. We've only got about 500 pairs south of the Pennine chain. Um, and the population overall has halved in the last two decades. And the usual drivers, habitat loss, agriculture, intensification, intensification predation, um, that are also impacting um, other breeding wader species. We know from work done by the BTO and others that the adult survival is quite good. Um, so over the winter, the survival is pretty good. There doesn't seem to be major issues on the wintering grounds at this stage. There may be local issues, but it's not having a, a population level impact. So the adult survival is over 90%. But work done by a whole range of organisations and individuals is, is consistently showing that productivity of our breeding curlews is poor. And that figure of 0.25 basically means that they're only um, producing about a quarter of a chick every year or a chick every every four years. And that's about half of where they need to be. They need to be getting to a productivity of about 0.5, which is a chick every couple of years on, on average. Um, so overall, based on a, a number of studies, if you take it all together, the productivity is about half of where it um, needs to be. And Graham Appleton, um, who, who does a lot of excellent blogging on, on waders in particular, um, he did a very useful sort of back of the envelope and calculated that we need 10,000 more chicks per year to fledge in the UK just to reach a sustainable um, population. So that, that gives you an idea of the sort of scale and it really drives us towards looking at national scale solutions. We can all chip in and do our bit locally, but to reach that 10,000 chick threshold, that's going to need national scale, big scale, um, agro-environment type solutions to, to reach that. If you look at the map on the left, that was from the BTO Atlas, which is now getting on for sort of 10 to 15 years old. Um, but you can see quite clearly highest abundance in the, the Pennine chain, where you've got the densest sort of block of red. Um, quite a lot spread elsewhere in northern England and in eastern uh, Scotland and parts of, of the Highlands but much uh, lower densities elsewhere. And our concern at the moment is that south of that dog leg black line, which covers all of Ireland, Wales and, and Southern England, we may have as few as 2000 pairs remaining and they're still declining pretty fast. So there is a genuine extinction risk in the areas south of that black line. Um, and, and that would obviously see the UK and Irish range contract by about 50%. So although the numbers in that area, only a couple of thousand pairs are not that significant compared to the overall population in the UK and elsewhere. We could see a significant range contraction in the coming decades if the current uh, predictions are, are correct. Next slide, please. Um, this slide has a significant health warning. There's big error bars on it, etc. 
Um, but what it does is it basically shows uh, a, a metric of curlew productivity in different UK habitats. So on the left hand axis is the productivity, i.e. the chicks per pair per year. Um, and so if you go up, uh, it's more chicks per year. And if you go down, it's less. And the bottom axis goes from poor habitat quality or heterogeneity, how variable the habitat is on the left uh, to good on the right. And then the level of uh, predator control on the right hand axis going from none at the bottom to, to high at the top. And what this shows is basically anywhere in green. So typically uh, upland moorland sites that are managed for curly or moorland fringe type habitats do very well uh, for, for curly productivity at the moment. Um, some nature reserves do pretty well. Um, other areas like upland farmland are sort of wavering around the threshold line, which is that dotted black line that goes across the middle. So anything above that line, the curlews are overall productive based on the best available data that we have. And below that line, they're not productive and therefore the populations are going to be declining. What we see is if you put in a line around 0.25 or 0.3, which is the red dashed line, many of our curly populations are sitting below that in terms of their productivity. So most of the lowland curly populations in hay meadows, lowland heath, silage sit below that line. Uh, a lot of other farmland sites sit on or below that line. So, so there's a significant challenge in bridging that gap between the dashed red line and the dashed black line, which is going to bring uh, most of our curly populations up to a position where they're productive in the future. And that's that's a really big challenge. So at the moment, it's only really upland areas that are managed for curlew uh, and other ground nesting birds and nature reserves that are consistently um, uh, producing enough curlews for a sustainable population. But there's there's a lot of uncertainty as to how well different elements of farmland uh, are doing, and it's going to be very variable in different areas. So that's some context. Hopefully that uh, provides a sort of national perspective and um, and some of the facts and figures at a national scale that we need to bear in mind when we um, are looking at some of the local schemes that we're going to be talking about today. First up, um, really glad that Barney's with us this evening from the South Lakes project. Um, with the Curly Recovery Partnership, it was great to, to see groups like um, Barney and Susanna's in the Lake District coming together and a really good model for a local curly group. So without further ado, uh, Barney, we look forward to hearing your um, update from the South Lakes. Good. Thank, thank you very, very much, Russ. Um, yeah, as Russ says, we're the Curlew Recovery South Lakes. Um, we're a bunch of very keen local volunteers in lowland South Cumbria. So it's an area of silage, pasture land, um, some National Trust wetlands and things, but mainly um, silage and grassland. Um, we're working very closely with a diverse range of farmers. The land is not all owned by one or two landowners. There's many, many landowners. Um, next slide. So we're proactive. We're looking, um, we're doing a survey around the 18th of April um, where we can find the territorial pairs and then we're focusing on nest finding. Um, and each nest we find, we fence it. Um, the farmers have been very supportive. We're working closely with them. We've we've had three farmer meetings so far this season, um, more previously. Um, each nest gets an electric fence, um, a 4G camera so we can monitor the nests remotely. Um, they get temperature loggers so we know um, after the fact what temperature it was in the nest and what temperature it was outside of the nest so we can see when the curlews are sitting and when they weren't. Um, when we get chicks we're colour ringing them that's a new thing we've been doing this year. Um, we're trying to minimise disturbance um, the 4G cameras are useful for that. Um, the solar energy energizers are useful for that so there's a number of things that mean we don't have to disturb too often. Um, and basically our experience says that unfenced nests get taken by foxes and badgers. They disappear. If you don't fence, they go. Um, thank you. Next slide. So this year um, we found 18 nests um, and five were predated before fencing, um, which I mean, curlew conservation is fairly traumatic and you know it starts fairly early, doesn't it? So five were predated fairly early. Um, leaving 13 nests which we fenced um, with 49 eggs inside. Um, from those 49 eggs, we had 25 chicks hatched um, and that produces four fledged 
chicks. And you can see bottom left, there's um, a curlew family just leaving the nest. Those chicks are about 24 hours old. And on the right hand side is um, one of our fledged chicks. Um, so yeah, um, the next slide, please. So a little bit more detail on the, the fledgings and the hatching. So as I say, we had 49 eggs in the fence nests. Um, we, we, there is a problem for us with eggs that don't hatch. So we had 15 of the 49 were infertile or died in hatching or were abandoned. Um, Sheffield University is analyzing um, lots of eggs from lots of curlew projects and we're keen to learn more about why that's happening. We wonder whether the warm weather made the eggshells harder and harder for the chicks to get out of. Um, but, you know, so there's, there's a question mark around why we're not getting um, enough eggs and chicks hatching, um, even, even when we get them to, to full term. Um, others were predated by crows, badgers, and we had one trodden on by deer. Um, so from the 49 eggs, we had 25 chicks hatched. Um, and we were monitoring every, every curlew brood every day. Um, so the keen volunteers were going out and making sure that we, we could find the adults. And you can tell from the adults whether they've got chicks or not. So you often couldn't see the chicks, but we, was, we were following the broods and following them every day. And they were going over some fair distances. If you didn't track them every day, you would lose them. Um, so I think one of our broods went over three kilometers. Um, so of the 25 chicks that hatched, um, and it's hard, to, we, we weren't tagging the chicks, we weren't putting electronic tags on them. So we're doing this from, from sort of remote monitoring with, with binoculars, but we believe that four were predated by foxes. There was a fox den right at the end of the, um, of the curlew field. They went, we didn't know it was there beforehand, but they went in that direction and disappeared. So it's our estimation that they were predated by foxes. Uh, we only had one um, lost to agriculture. Our farmers are good. We're working closely with them and they were moving silage in times. And um, so we're working closely with the farmers and managed not to lose too many to agriculture. Um, crows are an issue in our valley. We did a fair amount of um, crow control. Um, the farmers are doing fox control. Um, the curlew chasing the crow that you can see there was, um, was one, of, one of our nest cam pictures. Um, so our curlews are bothered by crows a lot. Um, other ones, other chicks were just missing in action. I'm not sure we can tell what happened to them without, um, without the tags on them. So we're not sure what happened to them all, but that's our estimation. So from the 49 eggs, we get four fledged. That's four, well, three more than we've had in previous years. In previous years, um, there was just one chick fledged in last year and the year before. So um, we've got more. Um, we're optimistic that our sort of knowledge and expertise and things this year, this coming season will uh, improve that figure, but it's, it's a fight, it's a war of attrition. Um, next slide, please. So I, I said we got improved knowledge and kit. Um, we, we know more or less where all our curlews, I mean, they're very site specific in their nesting, I mean, to a field or two. We, we know, I think, where most of them are nesting. Um, we've got better kit this year. We've got thermal cameras and bits and pieces that help us find, um, find curlews and find nests. We're continuing to build good links with the farmers, and that's vital. It's, it's much easier year upon year with the links that we've got. They understand what we're doing and they're happy for us to do it. But, you know, we're, at each stage in the process, we're making sure the farmers are happy. Um, nothing is assumed. All our permissions lapse every year and we make sure every year that we're okay to be on the land. Sorry, um, Barney, just quick uh, one minute warning. Yeah, thank you. Um, we fence when found. Um, so we lost them before fencing previously. So from now on, we're going to fence them when we find them. And we've done a bit of that this year and successfully. Um, so we've talked about daily chick monitoring. Um, Facebook and Twitter were very useful this year, made, made good connections, raised good funds. Um, very useful. We need to make you to do more predator control. Um, there are more nests that we could find in, in an expanded area. We need more kit. Um, we are fundraising. Um, and the last slide. 
the farmers are the heroes. I think these four pictures are of farmers that have mowed round our fenced curlew nests. Um, they're very good. Um, we put them to some inconvenience, but they're very good about it. Um, so this farmer in the middle here had three curlew nests on his land um, and, worked, and worked well with us. So that's a quick summary of Curlew Recovery South Lakes in South Cumbria. Thank you, Russ. Great, Brill. Thanks, Barney. A really good one to uh, to kick us off. And um, yeah, hard work, but some encouraging signs. And yeah, definitely, definitely keep at it. Um, I've just put in the chat the contact for Nicola Hemmings. So if people are interested in uh, contacting her around the eggshell work, and I see also the um, one of her colleagues at Sheffield has just been put in as well as a contact. So Nicola is going to be talking at the European Curly Field Worker Conference that I mentioned later on. Um, and through the Curly Recovery Partnership, we've been able to give her access to quite a large number of eggs. So it's going to be fascinating seeing what comes out from, from her ongoing research as to infertile eggs. Right, next up, uh, Matt Trevelyan, and we're going uh, east to Nidderdale. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Russ. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about Curly Projects in Nidderdale National Landscape formerly AONB, but just changed today, just to confuse everybody. And um, next slide, please, Ellen. So Nidsdale's right on the edge of the Pennines. Uh, it's one of the less well-known of the Yorkshire Dales, but we're a, a, a former AONB national landscape. And yeah, next slide, please. And I'm going to talk about two Curlew projects that I've been involved with, the Hartwith Curlew project and the Darley Beck Curlew project. I'm, I'm sort of a backroom Curlew organiser, if you know. Uh, so huge thanks to the to the real people on the ground. But next slide, please. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, particularly credit Clive White and, and the ecologists Jackie Smith and Kate Wright in the Darley project and all the photographers who I've borrowed pictures from tonight. But but mainly really to say thank you to the volunteers and the landowners and the farmers who've participated in both projects. So thank you very much. Next slide. So yeah, the Darley Beck project uh, is about 400 hectares and the Hartwith project a little bit smaller, 240 or so hectares, uh, at just a little distance away, a few miles away. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so there's quite a lot of similarities between the projects. They're both in areas of largely improved grassland and, and sort of typical field size for the Nidderdale area. Hartwith fields are a little bit more open, uh, both with significant wooded areas around them. Again, Hartwith a little bit more open, but still wood around in, the, in that area. Um, both projects were proposed by landowners and, and had huge landowner involvement. Um, and both projects working with volunteers. And I'm going to make a plug for the Farming in Protected Landscapes programme. So both have been largely funded through that scheme, which if you're in a protected landscape is a good source of money. Next slide, please. I think the thing that surprised us is how we've taken Curlew for granted in Nidderdale. There's loads of territories on both sites. Uh, we're really part of that Pennine stronghold, but as I'm sure you know, that appearances can be deceptive. So we've got large flocks of curlew in the middle of the summer and the farmers and members of the public sort of have this perception that we don't have a, a breeding problem um, because they're seeing curlew regularly and hearing curlew. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to include some of the statistics about volunteers, huge numbers of volunteers time and effort in the Darley Beck project, 29 surveyors in several teams, uh, you know, a huge amount of hours. Um, we've got a really quite intensive methodology for the curly for the Darley Beck project. We're really aiming to identify um, where curlew nest early on and the causes of breeding failure, you know, really uh, try and nail it. But we've had a in the Darley Beck project had a quite a remote uh, methodology trying to do this from field edges and and public rights of way so as not to cause disturbance to the curlews. So largely basing things on curlew behaviour, um, 
we're not approaching nests in the Darley Beck project. The Hartwith project uh, was bolder uh, with approaching nests and did this successfully without disturbing them. So we will take, we will learn from that in the Darley Beck project. Um, yeah, also a huge volunteer contribution from, from the Hartwith project, I should say. Sorry, Helen, you can move on. Um, the, one of the other differences is that the Hartwith project is, um, the, sorry, the Darley Beck project is an AONB project, uh, whilst the Hartwith project is managed by the landowner. So the, uh, yeah, and the Hartwith project also includes dairy farms, which previously some people might have said is incompatible with curlew conservation. And I think we've proven in Hartwith that it isn't always the case, which is great news. So. Um, We've got more predator control going on in the Hartwith area because there happens to be more local shoots in that area and the landowners, uh, you know, partially involved in those shoots as the AONB project is less uh, able to direct that that shooting, you know, the predator control uh, linked to local shoots. There is a bit of ad hoc predator control. Uh, the other big difference was that the Darley Beck project was able to trial a, a payment system for um, area based payments, thanks to a very generous donation. And this that meant we could experiment in the Darley Beck project with whole field uh, as or conditions relating to whole fields. You know, we could, in a sense, compensate the farmer for um, uh, lower stocking rates, um, delayed mowing, etc. And Hartwith didn't have the funding for this. So that meant we had two quite different approaches. Next slide, please. So the Hartwith project, because they didn't have that money, they, they were able to use nest fencing to take out a smaller area of land. Um, we didn't have a, a history of mammalian egg predation in the Darley Beck project, so we chosen not to use nest fences this year. And as I say, Hartwith had more active predator control and that meant increased use of larson traps and shooting. The AONB project, because it's an AONB project, we require sort of greater evidence base before we can deploy that lethal predator control as an AONB. There was some going on and we had very helpful keepers involved, but it wasn't as intensive. Next, next slide, please. So the um, nest fencing at Hartwith We'll, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so summary, we had 16 territories in, in Darley Beck, 14 of these nested. We lost track of one pair and the female from another disappeared. So 11 of the 14 sites were located. In three cases, nest fields were identified, but the precise location of the nest was not established. Next slide, please. You can sort of well, we'll move on quickly from that because it's difficult to explain quickly. Um, yeah, in in short, two nests lost the first clutch, one probably predated by crows, one probably by sheep. Both pairs laid a second clutch. Uh, one of these clutch hatched, but the other was destroyed by crows. Uh, so basically, we had relatively successful hatch rate in, in Darley Beck. Carry on, please. Uh, yeah, and we did manage to solve the losses due to agricultural operations largely in Darley Beck, but subsequently nearly all were predated. So that's very sad really, uh, only two chicks surviving till fledging, and we had quite a strict fledging definition in Darley Beck of six to seven weeks. So uh, keep going please. So Hartwith had 13 territories and 11 chicks fledged, is an estimation, but about that. Next slide please. Uh, lots of, obviously lots of fences, nest, uh, nest fences used in the Hartwith project. Uh, carry on, please. Uh, I'm going to skip across that slide, sorry. Uh, and just to say that we tracked predators, but we didn't have nest cameras in Darley Beck, but we largely foxes, we think are responsible for taking chicks at about three to four weeks. Next slide, please. Uh, and we'll keep going, next slide. And that's that's it. That we're done. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Matt. I think that nicely shows the the scale of the challenge. If you mitigate one issue, you've then got another one that becomes clear, and then you've got to work out how to mitigate that. But that's yeah, you know, that's part of it. And um, yeah, I mean that's a really encouraging start. Um, 
just say apologies for me having to chair quite harshly. We've got about seven or eight speakers this evening and we need it to be quite quick fire to be able to fit everyone in and give you guys time to answer a question. So apologies to the speakers and to you listening for, for having to, to butt in and give people a time warning. Right, next up, uh, Paul Noyes and Paul's going to update us from the Yorkshire Dales. Thanks, Russ. Uh, and on that note on timings, I'm worried I'm going to run over as well. So uh, I've got loads to squeeze into five minutes, so I'll just launch in right in if that's OK. So uh, next slide, please, Ellen. Uh, yeah, so as Russ's introduction helped with this, but obviously the Yorkshire Dales are crucial for Curlew. The Northern Upland chain is the last remaining wider stronghold for Curlew in England. And whilst we've seen the breeding population declines of around 50% between 1994 and 2020 that Russ has already covered, um, we've seen a, a non-significant increase in Curlew populations in the Dales. This is based on BBS data and we don't have the sample sizes to um, for a significant trend, but indications are that uh, populations are at least stable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, so a study by David Baines of GWCT and his co-authors co included four study sites in the Yorkshire Dales and reported high breeding success on farmland adjoining grouse moors, but also still relatively high breeding success on non-grouse moor fa farmland as well, which further supports the idea that Dale populations are stables. However, this shouldn't lead us to be complacent. Um, Curlew and the Dales do face several threats from afforestation and changes to farm support in England. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and it's for these reasons that BTO and the National Park wants to play our part in developing feasible curlew management options under environmental land management that are based on local expertise and sound science. And we put the call out to individuals and got a great group of people representing 12 farms spread out, spread out over the National Park. Um, the project was initially funded by FIPL, so I'll echo Matt's um, um, talking about how good the Farm and Protected Landscapes project is. Uh, but additional elements are now funded by the Natural England's uh, Species Recovery Programme. And the work now in total involves GPS tagging of 17 adult breeding curlew, uh, trialling two novel land manager monitoring methods, um, discussing this monitoring and curlew conservation in general with land managers at workshops, um, and local volunteer wader surveys and more intensive nest and brood monitoring. Uh, next slide, please, Ellen. So to start with the GPS studies, this shows uh, this slide shows an example of a farm near Askrig where we tagged a bird in silage. I've shown the extent of the bird's home range in the area shaded in black vertical lines with core area in the middle showing their core home range and I've highlighted in red dashed lines the neighbouring territories with white stars for known nest locations. You can see that the main area is only 550 metres at its greatest extent. Um, there was one additional site. Uh, the bird frequented about two kilometres away, but overall the bird was in the exact same location for its entire um, breeding attempt. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, so this slide shows a bit more clearly just how small these home ranges are. The nest was found on the 21st of April and predated excruciatingly close to hatching on the 19th of May. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide shows a site where we had eight tagged birds in close proximity. I've also added uh, known or strongly suspected nest locations to highlight just the incredible nesting densities. Uh, this was by no means exhaustive nest searching. So in an area of two kilometres squared, we had a minimum of 20 nests or 10 nests per kilometre squared. So um, really, really high densities of breeding curlew. Uh, but again, you can see the tiny home ranges uh, tantalizingly suggesting that in the Dales, at least many farm or even field scale interventions could have a meaningful impact um, for curlew. Uh, next slide, please, Ellen. Uh, so to return to the Askrig farm as an example of land manager monitoring, we asked this farmer to keep weekly estimates of waders using the wader calendar survey. His mean curlew count April to May was 4.67 with a median count of five. So that matches well with our knowledge of the four breeding pairs on the ground. But crucially, the wader calendar can allow us to collect greater levels of info on uh, wader relevant farm management. And this has un uncovered some interesting patterns such as this on this farm. We found two nests in the high silage fields in April and then a further nest in the low silage fields later on in May. And then delving into the management info, we can see that these high silage fields have livestock removed by early April, which seems to have initiated curly nesting. And then the low silage fields that are used for lambing um, April to mid-May. And then at mid-May, we've at that point, we found our first nest in low silage fields. Um, so curly seem extremely responsive to farm management. And we've found that out through working with farmers on monitoring. Uh, so next slide, please, Ellen. 
But as well as the WADA calendar, we asked participants to deploy a pre-configured bioacoustic recorder. Um, this table shows from the same farm, shows mean calls detected per day in five day windows across the breeding season for a range of WADAs. Uh, the local volunteer surveys estimated four pairs of curly and one pair of oyster catcher with no other breeding waders. And when we look at this table, we can see low daily detections for all species, bar curly and oyster catcher, which matches the volunteer, volunteer surveys well. So options for bioacoustic monitoring generally look pretty promising. Uh, next slide, please, Ellen. So to finish up uh, on nest monitoring, we monitored 29 nests in the dales with a 59% hatching success rate. Um, the 41% failed appeared to be largely caused by predation, similar theme to the rest of the evening. Um, though we only caught two nest failures on camera, one a fox and the other possibly a carrion crow, though crow may have been scavenging an already failed nest. Uh, next slide, please, Alan. That's um, five minutes, Paul. OK, uh, hatching success was surprisingly similar across silage, hay and pasture, but I did find a stark difference in hatching success of 93% uh, on farmland bordering grouse moor and 21% on farmland not. I mean, two big caveats to this is that this is based on my own local knowledge, but I do hope to get more objective data on that um, as soon as possible. And that nests bordering grouse moor are taken largely from one site, so it's not necessarily particularly representative, but the strength of the pattern here indicates there is something here and we'll investigate this further. Next slide slide please, Ellen. So to summarise, small home ranges uh, raise the possibility of far more field level interventions, though predator management will need to be on a wider scale, of course, uh, and different land management of fields requires different approach to monitoring and conservation in each land use type. And it's crucial to involve land managers at all stages of evidence collection and conservation planning. So echoing a lot of what's already been said tonight. Um, whilst it appears that the Dales population is stable and productive for curly, we need to stay vigilant to the risk of um, the risk to curly from afforestation and loss of traditional farm financial support with the shift to environmental land management. Uh, so next slide. So yeah, it's just quickly just to show the migra uh, Dales curly migration of 2023, and then happy to answer questions at the end. And um, also Tom or Paolo can hopefully give a bit more of a local perspective on that. Um, but yeah, just big thank you to absolutely everyone. There's too many people to thank in this time. I know Russ is cracking the whip in terms of uh, timing, so I'll have to leave it there and just say thank you. Great, thanks, Paul. And uh, a lot of data there, but a lot of really good innovative stuff. And um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be some good things to chat about later. So uh, for those of you that joined late, uh, if you have questions, please pop them into the chat and, uh, and we'll pick them up during a Q&A session at the end. And um, also, if people can't use the chat, we will give opportunity for people to stick hands up or failing that shout at the end. OK, we're now Moving to the Coley Forum, we met uh, a few days ago at Slimbridge and Phil Sheldrake is going to give the summary uh, of work conducted under that uh, forum. Over to you, Phil. Thanks, Ross. Good evening, everyone. Um, hi, yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm here representing the Coley Forum. We're really an informal group bringing together uh, groups, monitoring and sur surveying, monitoring Curley across lowland England and uh, a little bit of Wales now. Uh, we were established in 2017, uh, following the Slimbridge Curl of the, Curl of the Curl, Call of the Curlew Conference. Um, our mission statement is there, and uh, we've got a um, unashamedly self-appointed steering group of myself, uh, Mary Colwell, who you all, all know, uh, Jeff Hilton from Wild Island Weapons Trust, and the living legend that is Mike Smart. Um, next slide, please, Ellen. Uh, just to illustrate the groups that are represented, uh, there's a map there. Um, as you see, I've drawn on the, the line uh, that kind of uh, as, as uh, Russell highlighted earlier, actually, uh, that line that's drawn from South Yorkshire below the Peak District and then coming down the Welsh borders. And uh, now, as I say, uh, we include um, figures uh, from the, the effort uh, in Gwent in South Wales. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Uh, so this is just to give you an idea of the uh, the the figures that are submitted by these groups. Um, it's worth just mentioning here that um, 
there's no standard methodology adopted, standard methodology adopted uh, across all these groups. So all of these different um, uh, groups are taking different approaches and I think uh, approaches that are best adapted to the capacity that they have and the resources that they have and also um, critically the landscapes that they're working in. So surveying in Shropshire um, signage fields of course is uh, very different in terms of say servicing, surveying across the, the heaths of New Forest or on the, the plain, uh, Salisbury Plain. So that gives you an idea. So um, whilst we, whilst groups don't uh, as I say, they, they, they've they not adopted this. We don't have one standard approach to surveying and monitoring. Um, but what we do have in terms of st standardisation of, of results is all groups are working to a protocol in terms of um, uh, submitting results against uh, a, a code of breeding evidence. So when we see there, uh, the first two columns, just to illustrate that, we've got the total number of pairs observed and the second column being breeding pairs confirmed. So we have a set of criteria which groups are working to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to actually say that is a confirmed breeding pair as opposed to what might be, um, uh, might be better described as possible or, or probable. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, I hope that's large enough that all of you can actually see uh, the figures on that uh, on that slide, because uh, I've set here the 2023 uh, results uh, against the previous years that we've been collating results. Uh, and that goes back as uh, far as 2018. So we've gathered results from these groups from 2018 to the to this year, uh, with the exception of 2020 for obvious reasons. Um, now, do note the number of caveats at the bottom of the screen there. Um, but I think given that we've been collecting these results for a number of years now, it's worth, uh, I'm going to spend a bit more time on this slide, uh, just walking through, uh, taking a walk, stroll around the counties, really, taking a closer look, because I think um, what it what it actually shows is a surprising consistency uh, across the years uh, in each of these curlew populations. So. Uh, in many cases, the numbers are small, uh, but it, uh, going from top left, Berkshire, we've uh, got across those years between two and four pairs, one pair confirmed. Cornwall, we've seen to have uh, had an increasing population, um, but again, reasonably consistent figures. Devon, the population on Dartmoor is uh, critical, as uh, I'm sure you're aware. Um, Gloucestershire, so uh, a few more birds around in Gloucestershire and seven Avon Vales. Um, but again, you know, numbers around the sort of 1920 total number of pairs. And uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we've had increased effort in terms of monitoring br actual breeding attempts. Uh, so again, last couple of years, 10 and 12, respectively. Uh, so just letting you know, just letting you know, five minutes. OK, yep. Yeah. Uh, Hampshire, consistent number of pairs, Herefordshire, OK, so I'll speed through this. Uh, Norfolk, Suffolk, Oxfordshire, um, Shropshire, Somerset, Wiltshire. Across all counties, we see a consistent number of pairs uh, across each year or a degree of consistency. Um, does uh, does does raise a couple of questions. You know, if we've got a falling population, is this being masked by the increasing fieldwork skills within these groups, uh, or have these populations actually um, just declined back to the most favourable, or possibly better described, least unfavourable uh, parts of the landscape in these areas? Uh, but I think what it does tell us is that we need to do also celebrate the positive 
uh, positives within this, positives act actions and activities, particularly those of the volunteer groups uh, working. And uh, final slide, please, Ellen. Uh, so this just to set uh, the years, uh, the totals across the years. Um, so you can see since 2018, we've uh, consistently been in the 400 plus total number of pairs. So this does uh, go back just to reinforce and give us a very high level of confidence in the figure uh, that uh, Russell highlighted of approximately uh, 500 pairs um, below that line in lowland England. So yeah, that gives us a high degree of confidence. And just lastly, um, if one delves a little closer into the figures on this and bearing in mind we, because of the, the protocol we're working to, we are reporting what we know, uh, the minimum figure when it comes to breeding, number of breeding pairs and the number of chicks fledged. And if you calculate the productivity from those figures for each year across this table, you come out with an average of 0 0.4. Um, so uh, discuss questions there, much to discuss, I'm sure, and it will raise questions for you all. Thank you. Great, thanks, Phil. Lots of good data there. And um, of course, one of the things that's changed in the last few years is we have a very significant cohort of head started chicks that are being released into particularly southern England. I think at the forum we worked out that there are more head started chicks that are fledging every year than naturally uh, fledged chicks. And that's probably going to be having some level of impact um, as well. Right. Next up, uh, Harry Ewing is going to take us east to Breckland. Over to you, Harry. Hi, everyone. Uh... Yeah, my name's Harry and I study curlew in Brecklands and I have been for the last sort of five years. Brecklands in eastern England on the Norfolk Suffolk border. Uh, and as you can see, it's uh, an area that comprises mainly arable land uh, and that is kind of interspersed with patches of grassland and this really large forested area in the middle. Um, during my PhD, which lasted uh, between 2019 and 2022, um, and also my BTO field work, which I've been doing for the last year or so. Um, I've been covering around eight or nine sites across that Breckland landscape, um, purely monitoring curlew. So I haven't deployed any interventions to boost their breeding productivity just yet. Next slide, please. Uh, so in Breckland, we estimate that there's around 150 breeding pairs of curlew and every year I monitor between 65 and 75 pairs. Um, and as you can see from this table, the majority of those pairs occur on different types of grassland, but mainly sort of uh, dry lowland uh, grass and grass heath. Um, and we have a few pairs nesting in arable crops as well, mainly spring sown crops like, like sugar beet and um, spring barley. Next slide, please. <clears throat> These are all the different sites that I monitor um, and you can see the top two sites host quite large densities of curly, whereas all the other sites host densities of below one pair per kilometer squared. So th there are two really, really important sites in Breckland um, that host a really large proportion of this uh, really important population. Next slide, please. Um, so across my four years of my PhD, um, as well as finding the pairs, I was also going out and finding nests. Um, and in total, I found 204 nests across my PhD field seasons. But unfortunately, 75% of those nests failed, and that was mostly due to mammalian predation. So this graph here, you can see that um, the dark shaded areas are predation events that occurred at night and the blank area, the white area, are nest predation events that occurred in the day. And you can see that the majority of nest predation events occurred at night and that is indicative of mammalian predation because obviously things like crows are not active at night. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, so as well as nest survival being low, chick survival is also really, really low. Uh, and across those four years, we never reached the level of breeding productivity required to maintain a sustainable breeding population. So as Russ said at the start, you, we need around 
0.5 chicks to fledge every year um, per pair uh, for a sustainable population. But you can see from that table that none of my four study years during my PhD managed to achieve that level of breeding productivity. And we only fledged 40 chicks across those four years, which is abysmal, really. Next slide, please. So there are some things uh, that we can do to, to change this, to change the fate of curlew in Breckland. Um, and as a lot of the other um, talks have described, we can deploy predator exclusion fencing, which is this electric fence around an individual nest. Uh, and many, many studies have shown that these fences can double the uh, probability, at least, of, uh, of a nest hatching. So that's one thing we can do. The second thing we can do, um, Ellen, if you can. Yeah, we can manage vegetation so we can create suitable uh, habitat for curlews. So if you can imagine the Breckland landscape, um, it is mainly comprised of really, really short vegetation. But where we have tall vegetation, chick survival is significantly higher. Um, and this kind of complicated graph here um, basically shows that chick survival is higher um, during week one of, of their life um, when they are using shorter vegetation. But in week two of their life, chick survival increases massively when they use tall vegetation. So this suggests that curly need a mix of tall and short vegetation for foraging and for hiding in, um, particularly during their first two weeks of life. Next slide, please. So with this knowledge, uh, next year we are going to be working with Natural England, who are funding the project, and the Curly Recovery Partnership, who are managing the project, to target fencing um, at high density sites. Um, and those sites will hopefully have the suitable vegetation structure. So um, we want to boost nest survival with the fences and chick survival by targeting the fencing in areas where chicks are more likely to fledge. So hopefully we will produce way more of these really beautiful creatures uh, next year. That's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. Great. Thanks, Harry. Uh, you get the award for closest to keeping to time uh, so far. Let's see if Katie can knock you off to off the top spot. So again, over to Northern Ireland now and hearing from Katie Gibb of RSPB. Um, yeah, well, I'm going to give um, just a bit of an update of the Northern Ireland uh, uh, survey season that we had. Um, just at the beginning, Russell was talking about a 50% decline across the UK. I just wanted to highlight that here in Northern Ireland, uh, we're facing an 82% decline. So since the 80s, we've declined from about 5,000 breeding pairs, and we're estimating that we have about 150 left for all of Northern Ireland. So um, with our population models, we know that we're probably facing a local extinction uh, in the next decade. So we are the forefront of curlew conservation here and it's getting pretty desperate. But yeah, all right, so let's get onto it. So Ellen, next, um, yeah, thanks. So these are the three sites I'm gonna be talking about. Um, there is a, two other projects in Northern Ireland, but they're very small and I didn't get a chance to talk to them um, and they don't work with the RSPB. So um, the two lower sites that you can see down here, and this is actually where I'm, I'm at, um, I'm at the Loch Erne Reserve at the moment. So this is lovely purple, um, the purple uh, marker. Um, so all these three sites are part of the Curlew, um, the Curlew Life Project that the RSPB uh, was awarded in 2020. Um, you can see the map there of the three other sites that we have around the UK. So we've got one in Scotland, um, Geltsdale and Northern Wales. And this has been a massive project um, that's been undertaken to really go all out on curlew conservation. So it's real. It's all about hands on work. So it's about predator control, habitat management and nest protection fences. Um, and the whole aim of this project is to meet that 0 0.5 productivity. Uh, so yeah, uh, next slide. So we'll start off with uh, Upper Lock Urn. So this is, um, you can see it just down um, the little uh, orange bits in between those two uh, lakes. Um, so this is a priority landscape of ours, which means it's not a reserve. So um, the team down there work with, uh, with farmers. Um, they cover about 900 hectares. 
And you can see there that is their population graph. So they have been declining in numbers quite drastically, especially over the last three years. Um, through Colo Life, we are meant to be doing uh, nest protection fences, but due to the landscape, uh, this team really struggle uh, to find any nests. Um, and they have found one nest in the last three years and unfortunately it failed and they have not had any chicks fledge um, yeah, in the last three years. So it's getting pretty dire down in lock -in. Uh Next slide, Ellen. Yeah, so this is the RSPB uh, reserve, uh, most Western RSPB reserve, and this is uh, the upper lock urn. Uh, this is a really beautiful, um, so they work across all the islands here, and you can see there that that's, um, that's the livestock uh, cot that they use to take between all the islands, whether they're doing the habitat management or when they're doing surveys. Uh, so they survey over 200 hectares worth of um, over 12 islands. And so those figures there that you can see, so that's 43 pairs that they got this year. So that's 28% of our population here in Northern Ireland. Um, they have incredible hatching rates because they are on islands and they uh, and they have predator control. So not a lot of mammals get across to them. Um, but their biggest issue comes with chicks. So in the well, the biggest issue they face is they can't actually see um, get productivity figures because uh, they do all their surveying from boats and um, and a lot of the islands are domed, so they can't get good counts a lot of the time. Uh, they estimate that they had 12 chicks out this year, um, so that's a productivity figure of about 0 0.2, some rough maths in my head. Um, and so, but their population is increasing. They had an, a really good increase from 36 to 43 pairs this year. So that probably suggests that they aren't, that they are, they are missing a, a number of the chicks coming off. So, um, yeah, uh, I will go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, so this is the Antrim Plateau. So this is my site. Um, this is, um, 114,700 hectares worth of upland um, upland farms. So I work with about 100 farmers and we have a number of different projects here. So we have the Curlow Life Project and then we have a group, um, an agro, uh, a group scheme within the agricultural, um, the environmental agricultural scheme that we have over here. And so that's really brilliant because it means that I can work with the farmers from the get go. I do the plans for them and then I stay with them for the duration of their plan. And it means that I don't, I can work from not just one farm. It means that I can work at a whole landscape level. So it's almost like a reserve. It's absolutely phenomenal. And the farmers are just incredible. So um, we have had three of the most incredible seasons. So in 2000, and you can't, it is quite small, in 2020, uh, 21 was the first season that Curlo Life really took, um, took over. So we had a landscape scale um, predator control. So 5,000 hectares of our site is covered with predator control. Um, and then we are also doing the nest protection fences. So last year, um, oh, this season just gone, of the 37 pairs that we had on site, we got 30 of the nests and we only, we um, fenced 27 of them just because three of them were infertile. Um, okay, Tia, and so five minutes. All right. Um, and then, yeah, so um, our results from that, uh, from this season have been, we got uh, 19 broods to fledge. So that's a 51% percent, uh, percent of our broods get got to fledge. Um, and we had 55 chicks out. So in the last three years, um, we've had 152 chicks make it to fledge. And considering uh, Northern Ireland is on an absolute knife edge with curlew, um, and we've only got about 300 individuals breeding here, that is going to be an incredible injection into our population. But yeah, so thanks for listening. Great, thanks, Katie. That's a very positive note uh, to to finish the roundup on, and um, yeah, lots of of things that we can hopefully learn from that.
Um, in the best Oscar winner tradition, Jeff Hilton gives his apologies. He can't be with us this evening, but he has produced a pre-recorded video. Um, so, Ellen, can you fire this off? And I'm just going to keep an eye on the time. Uh, unerringly, there's sort of Jeff staring out at me, <laughs> which is quite, quite unerring if I do have to cut him off because I do want to give people time for questions. So, Ellen, off you. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight. Um, I'm on a train on my way to Cambridge. I will be when you, you see this recording. Um, but thanks to Ellen, Mary and the team at Curlew Action for, for inviting me. Um, I should start this talk about uh, Curlew Head Starting by, with a disclaimer, uh, I'm not a Curlew Head Starter. Um, I don't look after birds. Um, I'm a scientist who, who studies some of the, the ways that Head Starting does or doesn't work. Um, my aim here is to give you a, a five minute summary of, of where Curlew Head Starting in England has got to. Um, and I guess I should probably start by just reprising what Curlew Head Starting is. So at WWT, we discovered uh, a decade or so ago that with wading birds like Curlews, it is possible to take eggs from wild birds, hatch them and rear them in captivity and release them at about the age that they fledge and they're capable of becoming fully independent wild birds again uh, and joining the wild population. And the big advantage here is that um, most of the losses in the life cycle of a waiting bird come at these egg and chick stages. You know, the, a typical uh, pair of curlews will be rearing about a quarter of a fledgling per year. And when we head star birds, we can get that up to more like 3.2 fledglings uh, per pair per year. So we can give them a huge boost in their productivity by head starting. And it's called head starting, not captive breeding, because we don't have generations in captivity, right? We don't have adult birds in captive conditions laying eggs, which then go into the wild. We take eggs from the wild, rear them just for those four weeks as eggs, five, five weeks plus as, as, as chicks, and then they go out into the wild as, as fledglings. So that's head starting. And this map um, shows you, I hope, the seven locations where head starting has taken place in, in England, actually in the southern half of England to date. Um, so starting with Shropshire, the Curly Country Project, which started in 2017, um, followed by the Seven and Avon Vales, um, then Dartmoor and North Norfolk. And then finally, in the last couple of years, North Kent, South Downs and Cranbourne Chase. This is a bit of a, a, a tabular summary of, of, of this. So you can see the kind of years in which those projects are active. Essentially, six of them are active now, uh, you know, still going on. Uh, the Seven Vale one, which was done by WWT at WWT Slimbridge. We only did one year of that before COVID um, as a trial. So that, that started and finished. The others are all ongoing. The other project here, which is directly delivered by WWT in partnership with a few others is the Dartmoor project. Uh, we have a small role in the North Norfolk project, but that's largely delivered by the Pennsylvania Conservation Trust. Um, South Downs, Cranbourne Chase and North Kent Marshes are, are, are kind of under the aegis of the Duke of Norfolk. Um, and I don't know all that much about them. Um, a key distinction here between the different projects is where they get the eggs from. So in Shropshire, the eggs are taken from local birds, take the eggs out, hatch them, rear them, release them back into that same population where they originally came from. In the Seven Vale, in Dartmoor and in North Norfolk, um, we take advantage of the unhappy fact that many curlews choose to nest on military airfields where they are a risk to flight safety and therefore the nests are, are have historically been destroyed under licence um, to keep the airplanes safe. Um, now, what's happened recently is, is we've realised this is a potential source of eggs for head starting, which is a kind of no regrets source of eggs, um, insofar as those eggs were definitely going to die anyway. So anything we can do to help them uh, is, is, is kind of positive. Um, and if head starting turns out not to work, then to that extent, there's, there's no real regret. Um, the newer projects in the South Downs, Cranbourne Chase and North Kent Marshes, um, they are using eggs taken from large um, and healthy populations in the Yorkshire Dales uh, in, in Northern England. Okay, so, so what do we know about 
Head Starting um, so far? Well, the big question around Head Starting really is, is whether the birds that we release are as fit, um, as able to survive, breed and return to where they were born as their wild equivalents. Uh, and if they're not, how big is that sort of deficit in, in fitness? Um, how much worse are they? Um, and if they're not as fit as their wild counterparts, why is that? And is there anything we can do about the way we do the head starting that can, can help with that? So what do we know so far? Um, generally speaking, we can say that about 80% of the eggs we take from wild green curlews will result in a fledgling that we release in a head starting operation, which is about, which is really good. Um, it's, it's kind of about where we would like to be in, in terms of target. Um, it varies between years and projects, but that, that's a pretty good average. Um, we know in the specific case of the Seven Veil 2019 release of birds, that their survival after release, so once they're out into the wild, is about the same as wild curlews in the same area. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. One of the questions with these head started waders is, do they go to the sort of normal locations in the non-breeding season um, compared to compared to wild birds? Or do they go off to, to ridiculous daft places that aren't suitable? There's no, been no formal analysis of this for curlews, but the general, the recitings we're getting, and these birds are all colour marked or flagged uniquely, they are coming from the sorts of places we'd expect to see birds in the non-breeding season. So on estuaries, with other curlews, in, mostly in southwest England, a few in France, uh, Wales and Ireland as well. So, so it feels like they're, they're doing the kind of normal thing in the non-breeding season. Um, we are seeing some birds um, return to the release area to join the breeding population that was the target population that we're trying to help. Um, but there is an apparent deficit in the numbers, and that's particularly apparent to us in the Seven Vale, again, where we've got some very good data, and it was four years ago, so we've had plenty of time to observe. And what we're seeing there is that while we can account for, I think I think by the end of this winter, we, we knew that about 18 birds minimum were still alive because they were being seen on wintering grounds, we can only account for about half a dozen of them on the breeding grounds. So there's a sort of deficit of where are the rest gone, which we're still trying to figure out. And, and there are various reasons for it. It's not necessarily a problem yet. Um, we think it might be to do with the specific uh, ge geography of where we released them in the Seven Vale. Um, and we're waiting for more head starting projects to start coming through with data on this question. But there is a little bit of a question uh, on, on that front. Um, Ellen, can you just pause it there? So what do we know about population? So um, Jeff's still got some time to run on this, um, but I'm conscious want some Q&A. There's not that many questions in the chat at the minute. I've just done a quick scan. So please, if you'd like a question asked in the Q&A of any of our speakers, please pop it into the chat. Um, I'm going to give Jeff another couple of minutes and um, yeah, I'll see how many questions we've got and uh, engage it from there. OK, thanks, Alan. Carry on. We can only account for about half a dozen of them on the breeding grounds. So there's a sort of deficit of where are the rest gone, which we're still trying to figure out. And, and there are various reasons for it. It's not necessarily a problem yet. Um, we think it might be to do with the specific uh, ge geography of where we released them in the Seven Vale. Um, and we're waiting for more head starting projects to start coming through with data on this question. But there is a little bit of a question uh, on, on that front. Um, so. What do we know about this, these 2019 head starts? Um, I mentioned that we've got some pretty good analysis. Um, so we released 50 birds in August 2019, and I did a, a formal um, mark recapture analysis. This is a sort of statistical technique which accounts for the fact that you, you can't see all the birds that are alive all Ellen, the time. Can you pause it there? Just that fact. So um, I've just seen a couple of very pertinent questions come up that I think can be relevant to quite a lot of the speakers and I know that we'll get Jeff back next year to give some more detail on the head starting so I'm going to pause that one there um, and uh, and I'm sure we'll get Jeff to give the further details on head starting in due course but if you can come out of slideshow then thank you. So we've got about uh, 20 minutes for Q&A and uh, just to wrap up so 
Again, if you haven't put anything in the chat yet, but you've got a burning question, please do so. And then we'll go to, to the hands up um, once we've done that. Just looking through, um, there's been some correspondence and, and if people are interested in the work that Nicola Hemmings and her team, Jamie Thompson and others at Sheffield are doing, they are trying to understand why we seem to, in some populations at least, have quite a lot of eggs that aren't hatching, whether that's because of aging birds and infertility issues, whether some birds have got chemical loading through pollution in them that's having an impact, that's something that their team are, are working on um, at the minute. There's one um, relevant to quite a lot of the talks that we've had this evening, but directed at, at Barney. So I'll give Barney first option to respond from Tyler Wilson saying, fenced off silage areas which contain curlew nests. When the chicks hatch from those areas, how do they cope with moving across the recently cut areas to reach suitable chick feeding habitat without being exposed to predators? So that that ex extent around the uncut area of fairly open ground is quite hazardous. I'm just remembering that Barney's not there. Um, I'm just thinking who else would be a good one to tackle for that. Um, Kane or uh, Matt, you've both been working in areas where there's cutting going on uh, and you've been monitoring chicks. Would either of you like to tackle that of what your perception is of how chicks are coping with moving across quite open recently cut areas and being exposed potentially to more predators? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to. Uh, I think that uh, we had uh, two. We had two, uh, two sort of comparable project with the Hartford project and the Nidale project. Hart, the Nidale project, we did pay farmers to do whole field sacrifice and delay cutting, uh, and the Hartford project um, didn't do that. They had they cut round nest fences, you know, so uh, they had less cover for chicks, but they did have a higher success rate actually. So I would argue that um, it's it's not as simple as that it doesn't necessarily result in higher survival rates immediately. Okay. Um, and I see Pete's got a hand up as well. Pete, do you want to provide a comment on that? Hi, Russell. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, I'm just going to comment on, um, you know, as a farmer working with curlews um, and with them, them nesting in our silage meadows, we're a dairy farm in North Yorkshire. Um, and what we've actually found is that yeah if you you know we leave probably anywhere between a quarter and half an acre per nest um so a large area um the problem we find is that if you mow that grass around about around the area you've left um too close to to, to hatching then essentially the gra the regrowing grass doesn't get a chance to get long enough for the young chicks to then find their way to um essentially to to safe ground shall we say on the on the edges of the fields um and actually something we're going to try and do this next year is once we've found our nests we're going to try and mow consider considerably earlier to previous years so our usual mowing date would be about the 20th of may um, and hatching is about a week after that so what we can actually try and do this year is is mow kind of the first week of may maybe the second week of may um, so that should give the regrowing grass another 10 days, maybe two weeks of regrowth. So actually when those chicks do hatch out of the, their plots, essentially, then there'll be longer grass for them to, to then travel into and then get to the safe ground on the, on the neighbouring fields or on the, on the, the fringes of the, the mown fields. So that was just uh, my view on, you know, what we do up here in North Yorkshire. Great. Thanks, Pete. Is that Pete Webster? Yeah, it is, Russell. Yeah. yeah hi. hi, thank you for that. Um, uh, if you haven't seen the chat, uh, Paul Noyes mentioned that the bioacoustics recorder he's using is audio moths, um, and there's huge potential in this technology to be monitoring curly productivity and lots of other things as well. So watch this space for that. Um, a little bit of chat about surveys uh, and uh, in the Yorkshire Dales and Mike Pollard commenting on chick dispersal. The one I really want to move to though, so um, if Pete, actually, you put a question in, are DEFRA considering payments to farmers for curly conservation? Um, wouldn't that be lovely? Um, and there's a couple of comments here about, do any of the projects that fence nests pay farmers for the loss of the silage? Um, those of you that are working in those areas, uh, and again, looking at people like Matt, um, obviously, Pete, you're very much on the on the front line, Paul, um, anyone want to comment on, on that initially around sort of farmer payments and where we are with it at the minute? Yeah, I'll say something, Russ. Um, so our payments for curly conservation. Well, 
Uh, there's agri environment agri environment payments that uh, are delivered through delivery body Natural England. Uh, so DEFRA scheme delivered by Natural England. Um, stewardship payments. So these possibly are not directly aimed at curlew in terms of it's not badged as curlew conservation, but of course um, there are payments for habitat creation and habitat restoration, habitat maintenance, where species may be one of the target species, uh, where curlew may be one of the target species for that. Um, of course, this year, and we've heard it mentioned by a couple of the projects, there's funding through the Species Recovery Project uh, for curlew uh, groups. Um, and this is kind of a, a trial management approach through different groups, and that's targeting uh, different interventions uh, in the landscape, but also, I believe, uh, supporting different approaches and uh, through uh, being deployed by groups. And of course, uh, new on the new on the block, as it were, the highest tier of uh, the new England land management agro-environment schemes is landscape recovery. Now, uh, one thing we do know about curlews is we're not going to save them taking the traditional island approach of uh, buying and managing a nature reserve. Curlews require a landscape response uh, to um, support them. And that's very much what landscape recovery is seeking to do. So landscape recovery is uh, very much what it says on the tin. It's a large scale conservation initiative uh, through a project that is uh, large, uh, typically um, formed by a number of project partners, uh, whether they be local authorities, whether they be the familiar conservation NGOs, uh, or whether they be private organisations. But what landscape recovery does uh, facilitate is long term agreements. So these are designed to be 20 year plus agreements uh, preceded by a two year development phase to work up those implementation agreements. So this is working at landscape scale up to 5000 hectares in the first round of landscape recovery and the current round is unlimited in its um, uh, area. So this is a huge opportunity for species like landscape and one that should not be passed by. Thanks Phil, yep and um, one of the key things at the moment is we've got ongoing projects in England, Wales and Ireland, I think, specifically looking at trying to uh, resolve the issue around appropriate payments for farmers uh, trying to conserve curlew in farmed um, landscapes. So, so there is a lot of frontline activity. Um, as always, the key issue is it needs to be backed up with, with sustained funding and it's quite an uncertain uh, realm on that, but there are opportunities as Phil has mentioned. Tom, uh, you've got your hand up. Do you want to comment on this question as well? Yeah, thank you, Russ. It was just a point on on the mowing, the areas to be mown, and um, dealing with the dells, the the area that Paul Noyes covered, and the the slide he showed with a very high density, you know, sort of centred on that. Um, I've seen examples of people leaving, you know, tiny areas unmowed. I think Peter has very generously left them a quarter of an acre or something, but I, I've seen areas that are, where a nest is where they've just left probably three or four square meters uh, of ground unmown, and uh, the check chicks have have pledged successfully the other thing you know i suppose the difference between protecting them from just silage cutting operations or whether you're trying to protect them from silage and predation if you've got that suppression of predation the the latter is is less important in that environment but also using uh thermal images uh the night before mowing which our keepers did on a couple of occasions, I think the best they did was 17 in a night where they knew a silage field where the chicks had hatched, not obviously fledged, but were mobile and that that field was going to be um, mown. And they went out with the thermal images, found the chicks and moved them into an adjacent field where they were safe. And I think it was 17 in a single night was the best they did. So that's you know another possible option. Good, thanks, Tom. Um, I think one of the key things that's come out tonight is you've got to mitigate agricultural operations and predation. And if you mitigate one, you find that the other one comes to bite you or comes to bite the curlews. So, 
so it's so a ways in which we can deliver that in farmed landscapes away from managed moorland or, or or nature reserves or other areas with with you know intensive predator management is going to be really challenging and that's where the agri-environment scheme trials are hopefully going to provide some some input i would just mention someone made a question about wales um wales has a new project starting up uh with the support of of gilf near Cymru, curly wales um, and I'm sure we'll be welcoming them them next year to provide an update once that's had a year of, of field work under its belt. There's one other question I just wanted to pick up from Tony Ewing saying, can nesting areas be artificially created as with corridors to try to attract curlews? And what would those areas look like in terms of vegetation and flora? It was something we were keen to trial in the English project, but the timescales and the funding ultimately worked against us doing uh, elegant field based trials like that. But we would have liked to have done it. But I will um, ask Harry, did some really nice work in his PhD looking at sort of field margins and what works for chick survival. Harry, do you just want to comment about what you felt from your PhD work was the sort of best mix of vegetation and, and flora um, for curlew um, chick uh, fledging? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I didn't really look at different species of flora, but certainly uh, it was very clear that a mix of vegetation heights uh, and densities is key for curly survival. So there are some areas of my landscape where the the vegetation is completely flat and very, very, very short. Nothing fledges from those areas. Um, there are also some areas where um, there's only tall vegetation, so really, really dense, uh, tall silage. Uh, there's a couple of areas like that in the Brex. Again, nothing fledged from those areas. It is the areas where um, there are patches of short and patches of tall in quite close proximity to each other um, that provides chicks with areas to feed and areas to hide that are by far the best. Um, yeah, so it's, it, I would say it's mostly about structure um, rather than the individual species of, of flower and grass um, that that provide the the suitable habitat for curly because they, they can nest on really really rough grounds with thistles and and uh, nettle patches and bits of bracken but they still provide the cover necessary for curly uh, for curly chicks great thanks Harry. and it's a good point curlews in in you know when i was managing the curly recovery partnership i'd get phone calls from people saying oh i've got a curly nesting on our golf course and it's just in a bit of rough by the fairway or it's on a gallops you know in a bit of rough ground in the middle of a gallop so they're not particularly fussy about habitat as long as the sword's variable and there's enough grub in there um and uh, and the predator levels are suppressed and they can be quite successful in quite bizarre sort of habitats ones that we wouldn't necessarily think of as, as good uh curly um curly habitat so ellen can you just flash up the last um the last slide one of the things that curly action has as um uh, initiated, particularly after Mary, uh, myself, other colleagues, we did a couple of European road shows to places like Finland and, and the Netherlands um, in, the, in the last year or so, was a recognition that there's a lot that we can learn at a European scale by sharing uh, knowledge and expertise, not about the numbers of curlews, because they're already fora for people to swap that information and exchange that information, but more around the tips and tricks that, that we're all learning as field workers on curlews. Um, just through trialing things in the field. So with that in mind, um, we've uh, set up a European Curlew Field Worker Workshop. Uh, it's going to be a lovely venue in Kings Lynn in uh, Norfolk called the Red Barn. Um, it convenes on the evening of Friday the 9th of February and it will run through uh, sessions, workshop sessions on the 10th of February. And there'll be also a early morning field trip on the 11th of February before some further sessions and, and finishing sort of Sunday afternoon, something like that. So this is going to see um, field workers from across Europe joining a, a significant cohort from uh, the UK uh, and our other uh, surrounding nations uh, to come together and really um, swap expertise. And I would emphasise the word workshop. So we'll have things like finding nests, how you monitor chick survival, a lot of the things that we've been discussing about today, um, how you organise groups of volunteers, how you liaise with farmers. And one of the interesting ones um, that we're going to put in for the first time is this whole idea of how we deal with, with loss. So we're hearing a lot about climate grief, ecological grief at the moment. 
anyone that works with curl you will know it's quite a emotionally and often physically attritional um, thing to do uh, you go through what I call the curlew curve. Everyone's very enthusiastic at the start of the season and optimistic, uh, and the birds start coming back on territory, and everyone's still very optimistic and excited. And then you see this gradual attrition, and, you, and your sort of enthusiasm curve starts to wane off as you lose, first of all, nests from, from eggs being predated, and then gradually your chicks get whittled away. And often by July, you've sort of lost the will to keep going out there because there's hardly any chicks, if any, left. So Having that going on year after year for those that have been working on curly for a long time and, and hopefully will be, um, we want to explore, you know, what are people's coping mechanisms? How can we support each other um, as a community in what at times is quite a, a, an attritional um, uh, working working area? So if you're interested in that workshop uh, and we've hopefully reached a lot of people through our various channels, but if you haven't heard about it yet and you'd like to attend, um, please go via the Curlew Action website and just contact via the info email address and that will come into uh, Ellen and we'll see if you can get them on, get you in. Um, finally, just to say, as a Curlew Action trustee, we are looking for funding to support elements of the workshop. So even if you don't want to throw money at a, at a Curlew charity or national ENGO, but you would like to support some of the field workers that you've heard from today, uh, support their travel costs or, or other expenses associated with the meeting, um, then we are going to have part of the fund at Curlew Action around the workshop to support people getting there uh, and attending, not just in the UK, but across Europe as well. So, so again, you can go to the Curlew Action website and look at how you might donate if you'd like to, to contribute. Um, I hope that session was useful. It uh, raised probably more, more questions and answers. We will be exploring some of those topics uh, in a bit more detail in upcoming webinars over the um, winter months. Um, so please keep an eye. If you're not signed up, please uh, contact Ellen and we'll get you signed up to the mailing list. Uh, otherwise, a big thank you to all of our speakers tonight for spending some time coming and talking to us. Sorry for having to chair so harshly. Uh, we had quite a lot to get through, but I think we, we made it. And also particular thanks, Echo, the, the speakers to all of the volunteers that do the hard graph going out uh, and collecting the field data, because that, without that, uh, we wouldn't be identifying the issues and without identifying the issues, we wouldn't be able to start working on, on solutions to turn it around for curlews. So, so thank you for everyone that's been involved in various ways, supporting a lot of the work that you've heard about this evening. OK, that's it from us. Uh, thanks everyone for coming and hope to see you at a future webinar soon. Good night.